What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and this is another discussion video. This time, I'm going to wax philosophical about my very biggest wish list from the tabletop gaming industry. Right now, we're at an interesting part of the industry, with Games Workshop returning to its throne at the very tippy top, especially with the current wild popularity of Warhammer 40k. And its biggest competitors currently are mostly licensed IPs, and mostly from Atomic Mass Games, specifically things like Star Wars Legion and Marvel Crisis Protocol. So we may be heading into an industry that's entirely dominated by these licensed franchises. And there's one of those IPs that I have a sweet spot for. And one that I wish we saw done justice in the tabletop gaming space. So if I were to use one of my coveted genie wishes to convert one piece of popular culture into the miniature gaming space, that'd be the fragtacular space opera of Halo. Now, is this video an excuse to post some absolutely cracked Halo Infinite gameplay instead of my normal Space Marine gameplay? I mean, yes, absolutely. But also, I think it's an interesting discussion on the existence of licensed IPs in the miniature gaming industry. So let's dive in and talk about what makes licensed miniature games great and why, in my opinion anyway, Halo would make a pretty sweet tabletop game. Bear with me here. The Halo property is obviously long past its heyday. We've seen Videos of the early releases in the series when it drove fans to camp around the block waiting for releases of new installments, back when the franchise was the undisputed ruler of console gaming. And while it no longer commands that same level of infatuation, with the recent and so far widely acclaimed release of Halo Infinite, as well as the upcoming TV show on the way next year from Paramount+, Plus, it might be poised to make a return into the center of the cultural zeitgeist. So let's talk for a bit about why I think Halo would make an absolutely sick miniatures game and a real alternative to Games Workshop's offerings. So first, some super quick background for anybody watching who isn't familiar with the franchise. Halo is a semi-hard, kind of a half chub, I guess, maybe a nice gelatinous sci-fi universe set about 500 years in the future. Humanity has expanded into the stars and colonized our local area of the galaxy, but in doing so, made contact with several alien civilizations with whom we've been engaged in several existential wars. The first of these aliens were the Covenant, a conglomerate of interesting alien types to shoot at, unified by a shared belief system and also the ever-present threat that their home planets would get turned into lifeless rocks if they ever step out of line. During their war with the Covenant, however, humanity discovered and reawakened technology left behind by an ancient race called the Forerunners that had basically wiped themselves out in an epic battle with yet another alien race, the Flood, which are scary Lovecraftian zombie people. Over the course of 20 years worth of video games, including first-person shooters, but also RTS and other genres, novels, movies, shorts, these factions have fought and evolved in an epic whirlwind of operatic space battles. The most interesting part of the universe to me is its relative groundedness. All of the technology develops over time, each of the factions split, makes pacts, changes and evolves, and it all generally makes sense within the established rules of the universe. But what's really interesting to me is how it would translate into a tabletop game. Miniature games are kind of a weird animal in the gaming space. They have a lot of very specific requirements for a game to be successful. Obviously, the design language of whatever franchise you're appropriating has to be appropriate itself and both look good in a miniature form and be translatable to the medium of tiny plastic people. You need to have a good breadth of source material to make minis out of, to create an interesting in-game ecosystem with lots of optionality and room for growth, as well as be mechanically distinct and fun to play on the table. That's compounded with the need for constant releases since you have to fuel that release engine. There is no games as a service equivalent for a miniatures game. You have to be able to maintain sales of whatever miniature kit you're selling in order to keep the game afloat. And this is actually where a lot of licensed miniature games fall down. Games are a medium that people interact with for hundreds or thousands of hours over the course of their involvement. Whereas a book or a movie only provides a brief window into whatever universe you're in, a game immerses you for a long period of time. This often gives licensed IPs a lack of depth compared to their licensed games where a game has to dig super deep into obscure source material or actually just make up new additions to the IP to explore and expand and keep its player base involved 
However, both of these options lack the resonance inherent in licensing an IP in the first place. So let's talk about some specific examples from two of the most popular licensed miniature games. Atomic Mass Games, Star Wars Legion, and Cool Mini or Not's A Song of Ice and Fire, both of which have approached this issue super differently. Now, this might be an absolutely scorching hot take, given Star Wars' almost 10-year, very successful presence in the tabletop gaming industry since Fantasy Flight's acquisition of the rights to the license. But I don't think Star Wars is an IP suited to miniature gaming at all. And has mostly survived on the strength of its game design. Kudos to that Fantasy Flight team and now the team over at Atomic Mass because they have knocked it out of the park mechanically with their Star Wars games. And also Star Wars being one of the single most popular IPs in the entire universe. Especially if you're focusing your design efforts on the mainline movies and TV shows, the entirety of the canon Star Wars universe only consists of a couple hours of screen time which miniature designers are taxed with extrapolating into dozens of individual units and characters. The result of this overmining of intellectual property is that we get units like the newly previewed infantry support platform for Star Wars Legion, a vehicle found in the background of a single flyby shot in Revenge of the Sith, and one that is an objectively dumb looking design. Unfortunately for the game, however, the designers are stuck with it because the other options are to breach previously established canon or entirely design their own canon, which, while not without precedent, are two options that licensors are not typically comfortable with. On a bit of a personal note, I also don't think Star Wars really looks great when shrunk down into miniature form. Outside of a couple examples, especially like Separatist or Trade Federation units, the big AAT is absolutely on point. A lot of Star Wars designs simply don't make sense or are too bound to that mid-1970s mass-produced prop chic, with most of the characters just being a mass of cloth or uninteresting body armor plates. To be fair though, that's just personal preference and you may disagree. Factionation is also an issue with Star Wars as well, and one that's been felt in basically every Star Wars game released to date. Because every movie or era of the universe features a two-sided battle of good guys versus bad guys, with essentially the only visual distinction being that one side wears the aforementioned featureless plate armor and the other side doesn't, the breadth of available factions the game has access to is very limited. Not only that, but given that the timeline of the universe is so linear, pitting any of those factions against one another outside its era robs the game of a lot of that immersion that so many players gravitate to miniature games for. While pinning the mighty Grand Army of the Republic, led by a middle-aged Obi-Wan Kenobi and his young Padawan, Anakin Skywalker versus the plucky Rebel Alliance headed by Anakin's as yet unborn twins may all be Star Wars things. The super uncanonical game that gets played is pretty un-Star Wars-y. Now to look at a licensed game that tackles these issues in an entirely different way. Let's discuss Cool Mini or Not's A Song of Ice and Fire. Cool Mini or Not, or Simon, dodges this issue of limited source material to convert into miniatures with a unique and interesting method, which is to pick a source material that doesn't actually have any source material. It's important to note here that the license that Simon has for the George R.R. R. Martin property is for the Song of Ice and Fire book series, sublet to them via Dark Sword Miniatures. It's not for the HBO TV show Game of Thrones. So while the line can use recognizable characters, factions, and heraldry, it can't directly rip off the show's depictions of them. So the version of Westeros you get in A Song of Ice and Fire is kind of like if you ordered Game of Thrones on Wish. This has big benefits though. I don't actually know how to read, but my knowledge of A Song of Ice and Fire book series is that it doesn't really go into exhausted detail about the exact composition, outfitting, and training of various military units in each kingdom. That gives the Simon team basically unlimited access to design their own stuff which is exactly what they've done, filling the game with dozens of unique, bespoke, and also totally non-canon regiments and orders of warriors to fill out their rosters. This solves a lot of the issues that we discussed before with the Star Wars IP. Cool Mini or Not isn't law-bound to use existing units and try to shoehorn interesting game mechanics into those designs, but at the same time, they can't leverage the full power that pairing with a powerful intellectual property can bestow. A Baratheon Warden from the Song of Ice and Fire miniature game is a frickin' sick looking model, but nothing about it really screens Game of Thrones or Song of Ice and Fire. Taken out of context, much of the game could be mistaken for basically any generic fantasy or even historical miniatures. So while you get that name on the box, what really is the benefit of getting that Song of Ice and Fire license? So what does this have to do with an IP 
like Halo. Basing a game off a universe already specifically designed to have games based in it has incredible benefits for the depth of any new game created for it. Just taking a gander through the enemy rosters in any given Halo entry or the tech tree of a Halo Wars game gives an absolute smorgasbord of cool, unique, recognizable, and definitely Halo units, vehicles, and characters to convert over into miniatures. And there are actual mechanical gameplay benefits to co-opting an IP like this as well. In any game, whether it be miniatures, real-time strategy, or first-person shooter, the ability to quickly distinguish between different weapons and troops while you're playing the game is crucial, allowing you to make unique-looking units that both fit aesthetically with one another, while at the same time being conducive to an easily recognizable game state. So it's a good thing that a design language created specifically for gaming has all of that present already. It's the exact same reason that the Warhammer 40k universe has been successfully converted over to video games in the reverse, especially RTS like Dawn of War. And that's because this is something that 40k has done well. Some of the new Primera stuff aside, at a glance, you can generally tell the difference between a model holding any different set of weapons, a bolt gun versus a plasma gun, or a las cannon versus a missile launcher, all of which helps enforce the narrative of the game and also helps inform play. So I've touched on the upsides of licensing a game IP, but there are definitely some downsides as well. The biggest issue with adapting a game out of a gaming franchise is that there are already other ways to interact with it. Unlike movies or books, where watching an episode or reading a chapter could get someone motivated to dive into that universe and play a game of the tabletop version, if someone was getting pumped by Halo, they could, I mean, just go play Halo. Now, obviously, you could say the same thing about something like Star Wars. If you get hype watching Revenge of the Sith, you could jump into a game of Battlefront or the Old Republic to get your good old George Lucas fix directly into your brain. But I think it's a different issue because for Halo, the primary mode of interaction with the universe is already within a game. So tacking on a second game is understandably awkward. That said, with the Halo universe expanding to more live action content, this could be a pivot into more of a multimedia experience with which a miniature game could go very nicely. Halo is no stranger to live action content. Each game typically comes alongside live action shorts and advertisements and two canon feature length movies for the universe exist already. Now, all that said, there's also something else about a Halo miniatures game I haven't touched on yet, and a fact that might backslap any chance of this partnership happening at its spawn point. And that fact is, there's already been a Halo miniatures game. In fact, there have been three. The first released in 2007 to coincide with the release of Halo 3. It was a WizKids Action Clicks expansion that featured a ton of iconic vehicles and characters from the series. It actually had some pretty sweet sculpts, especially for a Clicks game, which is notoriously garbage for its actual miniatures. And they actually made a true scale scarab kit as well. This thing was absolutely enormous. It's kind of debatable whether a clicks games are actual miniature games. They're played on a grid and come packaged in randomized booster packs. They're essentially closer to board games with collectible pieces than they are a game like Warhammer 40K. The expansion also tried really hard to directly convert over a lot of the video game Halo's game mechanics onto the tabletop, including multiplayer lobby-esque respawning and weapon pickups, which is an odd choice for a tabletop game, and probably removed a lot of the gravitas from gameplay. Not only that, but as essentially an expansion to an existing game system, this little WizKids side project was never going to last more than a few releases. The first Halo true measurement games, basically what we would consider a miniatures game a la Warhammer 40k, released in 2015 with the appropriately named Spartan Games acquisition of the rights to the Halo license. This was Halo Fleet Battles, a tactical space combat experience. Space combat is a staple of the series' expanded lore and is well documented in novels and other media pertaining to Halo, but is never actually really experienced in a mainline Halo title, making the decision to base a game entirely on it a pretty odd one. Even worse, the game's insistence on using a true scale system rather than a sliding scale system favored by other games like Star Wars Armada meant that large and particularly recognizable ships from the series that are often treated as hubs and home bases in the games themselves, things like the UNSC Infinity, the Spirit of Fire, or CSO Super Carriers were literally too big to ever put into the game. Not only that, 
but Spartan competed directly with one of their other titles, that being Firestorm Armada, which promised a remarkably similar fleet battle experience, just with a unique and bespoke IP. Now, these oversights were rectified by Spartan Games' next addition to their roster, that being Halo Ground Command, which released one year later in 2016. However, in another misstep, rather than the 28 to 30 millimeter scale game that could showcase the recognizable designs of Halo's troops and characters, Spartan Games elected to use a 15 millimeter platoon size system that put several one third inch tall miniatures on each base to represent squads or fire teams on the table. There's nothing like getting excited about playing your favorite Spartans or elites from the series only to have them lost in a sea of minuscule identical troopers. Ostensibly, this was to allow larger vehicles to fit into the game without being way too large, but the misstep became clear as ground battles released to a wet flop, with most gamers at the time totally unaware it had even come out. While I can't say for sure personally, I'm pretty sure that these two slip-ups spelled the end for Spartan Games, which shuttered its doors in 2017, one year after the release of Halo Ground Command losing the license to Halo entirely and resigning those games to the dustbin of miniature gaming history. While they're no longer officially supported, unlike Spartan's other lines, which were picked up by War Cradle games, there are still small but vibrant communities of gamers for these systems to be found online, making homebrew rules to use with 3D printed components. So this franchise has already probably killed one gaming company. Does that mean it's totally untouchable or is there a possible future out of the multiverse where a Halo game hits tabletops once again? I'm not sure. To be honest, I feel that the previous games have done the IP a disservice and a franchise like Halo actually has a lot to offer the tabletop gaming space. Grand air wings and tank battles and spaceship combat sounds great and all, but they aren't really what Halo is known for. This fleet combat or large battles aren't the core fantasy of the Halo universe, whereas heroic individual characters, tight teamwork, agile movement, and small-scale skirmishes are. Just imagine playing the Storming of the Beach and Silent Cartographer in a tabletop game and tell me that wouldn't be absolutely sick. A skirmish-scale game featuring 15 to 20 models as well as a couple vehicles per side with rosters drawn from recognizable factions like the UNSC, Sentinels, Pre- or Post-Schism Covenant, Banished, The Flood, Prometheans, could be a phenomenal addition to the current skirmish-based miniature game market and a breath of fresh air from the stodgy IPs of yesteryear, like Star Wars and Warhammer that currently dominate the industry. Or maybe I'm totally biased. I don't know. Maybe my aesthetic sensibilities have been molded by nostalgia, and I'm actually totally wrong. The game would flop monumentally. Let me know down in the comments what franchises you'd like to see made manifest in a miniature form, and whether you think a Halo miniature game would be as awesome as I think it would be. And uh, if you happen to have the license to create Halo-based miniature games lying around somewhere, maybe you left it on your coffee table and forgot about it, just hit me up. I'll jump on your design team for free, probably anyway. Anyway, thanks for watching. One thing I do want to mention before I close out the end of the video, I just wasn't sure where else to put it in my script, is the comparison to Infinity that's bound to crop up in the comments down below. I recognize that Infinity is heavily influenced by Halo, both aesthetically and conceptually, and would be similar to the skirmish game that I envisioned earlier. The biggest difference is that Infinity is a gross and weird anachronism of a game, so let's not talk about it too much. Anyway, that's all I have to say about Halo as a miniatures game. Thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. Big thanks to everyone who supports the channel over on Patreon at patreon.com slash tacticaltortoise. YouTube channel members, Twitch subscribers, all those folks that help me keep the light on in this pretty new studio that I'm currently working out of. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming.